Okay, gang, welcome to Idaho. I got my buddy Bill Wilson with me. And we got some more Gun Guys stuff for you. And in this episode, we're going to talk about some of my favorite handguns, particularly some of my favorite revolvers. Uh, these are guns that I really like, but I don't shoot them all the time. And probably the most important one we want to lead off with, and there's a special one in my, in my life. When I was about 13 years old, which was pre-68 Gun Control Act, I worked all summer, uh, I hated every minute of it, but I made enough money to get my first handgun, which was a Smith & Wesson K-22. This oh, is that wow, gun. That is way cool there, Ken. And I've shot a blue million rounds through that gun. Oh, you can, you can tell by the ejector rod there. There's yeah. no finish whatsoever left on the ejector yeah. rod. And that's, that's why a, that's an indicator there that a gun's been shot a lot, yeah. as well as the breech face, yeah. you know. And that's how I learned to shoot a handgun. That's the gun that I learned on. By the way, when I back in those days, we all shot single action. It wasn't until later that I got into shooting double action. But it's got a pretty good double action yeah, pull. It's, pretty, it's, it's had a few BBs through it. <laughs> and you remember the days when you went out? I don't care whether it flew or crawled or swam, whatever it was, it was target. Mm -hmm. you know, you, well, yeah. I mean, it, whether it was, you know, starlings or bullfrogs, man, that that gun accounted for a bunch of them. Yeah, so, that is way cool. So it's a cool piece of history, and it's hence one of my favorites. Yeah. You know. And then we'll branch into some other stuff that's somewhat interesting. For example, I was always a big 44 mag guy growing up, you know. I've had a bunch of them, still have. I don't shoot them hardly anymore. My hands can't take it. Probably one of the reasons I'm paying the price uh -huh. arthritis-wise is shooting these things. But here's one that I've always been kind of a fond of five inch barrel revolvers. And here's a Smith & Wesson five inch 29, which oh, are, wow. have quite a following. And it's a honey, I don't, I haven't shot that gun a whole lot, but as you can see there, it's a, just a cool gun. And yeah. they become pretty desirable. I mean, you know, lots of people now, you know, the cl more collectors and shooters, unfortunately, have glommed onto those things. Nice set of grips too, nice piece of wood there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Ken. I'm, I'm kind of like you, I, I'm, you know, I, I like four and five inch revolvers. Yeah, so this one has always been a, a favorite. And then along that line, a number of years ago, um, at Smith & Wesson, one of the guys that was in charge, particularly in the performance center, the revolver hero, the guy that was the guru, was a guy named Jimmy Ray. Jimmy's a star. and he really did great revolver work. And I approached him and said, Jimmy, I would like to have a five inch 629. At the time, they were making the underlug version, mm -hmm. but I said, I want the half lug barrel traditional gun. And bottom line, Jimmy Ray built this gun for me. It's a 629 with the half lug barrel. Still has that front sight interchangeable mm -hmm. thing. You'll notice he did a nice crown on the barrel. Anyway. Built the gun, tuned it, it's got a trigger pull, you won't believe. It's accurate beyond belief. Craig Spiegel made me a set of stocks and they're typical Smith & Wesson Roper pattern, but if you'll notice, they're very thin. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a really nice gun to shoot. Be honest with you, I shoot a lot of 44 Specials and not much 44 Magnum anywhere. But anyway, it's yeah. actually a slick gun. And wait till you try the trigger, you know. And I got, and it's amazing thing is it bust every cap you put in. I've never had a misfire with that. Well, that had it. That's smooth for an end frame. Yeah. Man, that's nice. Great all around gun. It's got the the newer type, you know, cut on the cylinder there, so it will it'll actually handle heavy loads if you want to no, shoot some big no, heavy three hundred grain. One of the so. ones that yeah, it's just it's one of my favorite guns. And of course, I this is a. Uh, um, HC leather guy, basically a m version or a copy of this old Lawrence Keith 120 Elmer mm -hmm. Keith holster yep. I had made up for it. So, again, don't shoot it much anymore. Be honest with you, as scarce as it is, probably just as well I don't shoot it a whole lot. That That's kind of a nice 401k yeah. gun. When I first moved out here, I learned at this time of year, carrying a revolver with a couple of First couple of charge holes with snake shots, not a bad idea, because I live in a real rattlesnake zone. And I used this, carried this for a long time. I don't much anymore, because I learned you can kill them with the 38 snake shot just as you can as well as the 44. But this is a 1950 Target Smith & Wesson 44 Special, five inch. And mm -hmm. it's 
got a pair of Craig Spiegel stocks on it. Um, I did have Novak put a gold bead on it. And bottom line, I actually carried this thing for a lot, shot a lot, and with that, the old Skeeter Scout load, 7.5 grains unique, and a 250 grain Keith bullet, yeah. it, it'll just about take care of anything you need to take care of. So it's got a U-notch rear, the gold bead front, and this era of 1950 target revolver is actually not very common. Yeah. Craig Spiegel did a, using, I think it's French walnut, he made a beautiful pair of stocks for it. Yeah, and it, it's thing. a great shooting old gun. It, and it's had no trigger work. That's the way I, I never screwed with it, you mm -hmm. know. Because let's face it, if you're shooting a rattlesnake at three feet or four feet, you don't need a great trigger. Where are you going to use single action for that anyway? Yeah, yeah. single action, you, 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 you can't go wrong. But anyway, nice. so I don't, again, I don't carry it much anymore. I did when I first moved out here. This was kind of my summertime rattlesnake gun. So one of my favorites, but not one I use a whole lot anymore. One of the guns, and I've got, like you, always had a little bit of a thing for single action because, you know, we grew up in the cowboy mm -hmm. TV and movie era. But here's one I got not, oh, maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. The guy who was one of the deans of nice single actions is Hamilton Bowen, custom mm -hmm. guns. And I had Hamilton, he's built me a number of guns. By the way, another Lawrence 120 mm -hmm. Elmer Keith holster. But this is a Ruger 44 mag. Um, Blackhawk that I had him do for me and it's got I like a lanyard loop and mm -hmm. basically you know but I think you've got some of yeah. Hamilton's guns but gold bead front sight and of course he does tunes the actions and does a trigger job and again I shoot that gun when I do mostly with 44 specials but Hamilton does just superb work so that tall front sight you must have it to where it'll shoot Three hundred grain loads too. Well, it, yeah, I, and he's smart enough to realize that, you know, if you don't give them, a, you can make up for the point of impact a bit. But if you be shooting three hundred grain bullets, if it ain't high enough, you'll never get a zero. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's a sweetheart. I shoot it some, but not much anymore. But I really like the gun. And people often say to me, well, why would you have a lanyard loop on your gun? And my answer is, lanyard loops don't matter until you need one. <laughs> and then they're really, really important. So, but anyway, cool gun, and his workmanship is just, you know. Oh yeah, Hamilton does beautiful work. Yeah. And I've got two or three of his guns, but this is probably the one that, if I would drag one out to shoot, this mm -hmm. is the one that typically makes the makes the journey. This gun I'm about to show you is real important to me, because the old guy that was the when I was growing up, a little kid, my neighbor was a guy by the name of Charlie Gillis, and he was a gun guy. And and, and, and became kind of my mentor gun-wise. I mean, my dad was not into guns. He didn't have anything against them. He just didn't, they were tools that he didn't need. But Charlie would go out to the range before we lived back in Ohio, come home and he had a picnic table in his backyard. And he always lay his guns out on the picnic table and clean them. While I was a little kid, I'd go over and watch and I was like, this is really yeah. cool. So Charlie was always my influence to a great degree. And yeah, you've mentioned him numerous times through the years that yeah. I've known you. And then he bought in 1956, when they reintroduced the Colt Single Action Army, he bought this gun. This was the Lawrence Holster. He's one of the impressed me that Lawrence Holsters were the way to go. And back in the day, Lawrence and S.D. Myers were the two big holster companies. That's before Safari Land or Binky, mm -hmm. anything has existed. But anyway, when he passed, I managed to get this gun. This was his. 45 Colt Single Action Army. I remember he bought a block of ivory and made the stocks for it. And um, it, it just, it, to me, it was as cool as it got, especially growing up in that mm -hmm. TV Western era. So I got the gun. I still shoot this one, not a lot. And we're going to shoot it before you leave because everybody needs to shoot this. I call it the Charlie gun. And it's, it, it really, Colt Single Action Army is part of Americana. And this one, because it was Charlie's, is a real special gun to me. Oh, yes. And he shot it and used it a lot, and it was, you know, it, it was always a tool to him. It wasn't something that was a safe queen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like either he or you would have carried it a little bit. It's got a little bit of holster wear on the Yeah, on he the carried edges. it. I say, this is the holster that he yeah. bought back in the day. And uh, 
you know, and say we're going to yeah. shoot it down the range, and uh, it, it's just cool. I'll tell people it's an amazing amount of people that have never really fired a real Colt single action army. Mm -hmm. You know, they've handled them or seen them or whatever, but a lot of people have shot Rugers, but a Colt single action army is a pretty unique gun. And yeah, again, it's really special. Part of America. Mm -hmm. So we will give this one a uh, chance for you to bless it before you leave. And then I have another Colt single action army I'm going to show you, which is really cool. For a period of time, I worked for Colt, as you know, for a couple mm -hmm. of years. Primarily as a brand ambassador, but I mean, I didn't work in a factory or anything. But one of the things I asked them when, is I would like to have a Colt single action army. And for whatever reason, one of my buddies growing up had a, a Winchester 92 and 3840. And we used to, he loaded for me, shot. I was always enamored with that cartridge. So I asked the guys at Colt to make me a new single action army, third gen gun in 3840. Wow. I want a four and three quarter. I want a case hardened. I wanted ivory. And it also comes with this kind of unique that this is a one of a kind. Yeah, there's a there's 30 the 40 cartridge there for okay. anybody that's not familiar with the old yeah. cartridge there. And the unique thing about this gun, aside from the fact it is beautifully made, it comes with a spare cylinder in 10 millimeter. 10 millimeter. Oh, awesome. One of a kind. So you can yeah. you can shoot either 3840, which I you know reload for. And by the way, it's not much fun to load that that yeah. bottleneck case mm -hmm. is not a you got to pay attention. You can't mm -hmm. drink too many beers when you're loading this <laughs> stuff. So, but the unique thing about the gun is, uh, among other things, it has a wide spur original cold oh, hammer. Wow. Yeah, that, yeah, I didn't even know they existed. And yeah, it turns out those out. hammers were made back in the 20s. If you look at it, you can see it. Yeah. It's not yeah. machine checkered. That's back when they still was basically the, the checkering and the knurling was engraved. Yeah. Anyway, they built me that gun. Never seen one of those hammers before. No, I, it, and Greg, the guy, the custom shop that built it, told me when I was specking out the gun, he said, well, do you want a wide spur hammer? I was like, what? So he opens his drawer in his bench and he had this old cardboard box, and there must have been 20 of these things in the white. And he said, well, you want one of these fitted to the gun? I was like, oh yeah. yeah. And I said, I want a case hardened to match the frame. Yeah, no big deal. But I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, apparently Colt made these back in the 20s, but nobody ever knew they were available or offered. But every guy that was the single action builders, when they retired, they just passed that box on to the next guy. And so anyway, they made the gun up. And I remember I asked, I said, no, I want this gun sighted dead on at 20 yards. And Grace said, I can't do that. I was like, well, he said, we only have a 15 yard range. <laughs> I said, okay, one inch high. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. and I shoot, I do shoot this gun. I mean, I, everybody said, well, that, that's, you know, that, that's a, too nice to shoot. Yeah, well, you know what? I'll let the next guy worry about the wear on the gun, but it's a cool gun. So I do have a kind of a weak spot for single action, you know. And I do shoot them, so typically. Hang on. Oh, okay, here's a good one. While you were a Python 357 guy, I was pretty much early on an in-frame Smith & Wesson mm -hmm. guy. And my favorite in-frames are five inch Model 27s. And this is one of, this is my gun, and it's kind of, you know, it's, it is a shooter. You can see it's actually, I didn't clean it last time I shot it. I don't shoot it a lot anymore. It's got fuzzy ferrant grips, which were made for my hand. May not fit yours, but they fit my. And I wanted to send it to Jimmy Ray, and he had retired, so I, he recommended. I think it was the guy's name was Alan Tanaka out in L.A., who's a real good revolver, Smith Weston Smith, and I had him do an action job. But these old end frames will take a lot of 357 loads. Oh, yeah. Can't hardly hurt one, and that, you know, five inch 27s have always been kind of a soft spot for me. And that's been pretty much my shooter, you know. Nice. Yeah. The grips are, again, Fuzzy Ferrant was another one of those uh, LAPD firearms instructors who made custom grips for. As a matter of fact, if you ever remember the series Adam 12, mm -hmm. those guys had Fuzzy Ferrant grips on their guns in the TV series because that's what a lot of LAPD cops oh. were using. That's neat. So, cool gun. 
And then, along that line, when the FBI adopted the Smith & Wesson 357 Model 13 revolver, mm -hmm. our old buddy Dick Thomas bought a couple. And he sent one, and what, he bought one because Jim Cirillo wanted one, and he sent it to Jim. And Jim did the action jobs on both of the guns, Dick's and the one he had. Jim was smart enough to realize you want it smooth the trigger, but you don't want to lighten it so it doesn't bust magnum primers. Anyway, this this was Jim's gun, and he did you know he did some work on it, and did his action job, which you you know it's smooth, but it's not light. And he happened to mention after we were some place I don't know if it was a match or whatever that he didn't really care for the K frame 357. He thought it was a bit abusive. And you know he did pretty good work with a Model 1038 Special. So yeah. he said, I don't think I'm going to keep it. I went, what are you going to do with it? And he said, I don't know. I said, sell it to me. <laughs> and he did. Oh, and there's a three-inch, 13-round butts, which now are pretty desirable guns today. Well, especially that this was Jim Cirillo's gun. Yeah, I mean, and it's a, a it's a pin barrel yeah. hero one. Yeah, that's and try the action on it. It's not light, yeah. but it's pretty smooth. Yeah, it's very shootable. Yeah. Ooh, that's almost too light for the single action. Yeah, it's lighter than I would yeah, I mean, be comfortable with. Great for a range gun, but I wouldn't want to carry that. No, one. no. And fortunately, you're like, uh, we don't shoot them single action much anymore. Yeah. But anyway, and you see Jim relieve the grip for speed mm -hmm. loader. And I, I didn't realize it until a, a while back. He actually, sh you can see, he shaved a little bit off oh, the yeah, thumb piece all. to get the speed loaders in. But Well, what's yeah. really cool about that is the fact it was Jim Cirillo's gun. Yeah, cool gun, yeah. At the time I bought it, it was, I didn't, Jim Cirillo connection meant nothing to me. I'm sorry I didn't get a letter, but back then mm -hmm. nobody cared. I wish Bill had, that, that Jim had put give me a note or something. Mm -hmm. like so it goes. Another revolver that I'm kind of fond of, to me, of all the Smith & Wesson revolvers, the three and a half inch 27 is the most impressive looking gun they make. And this is mine. Oh, yeah. Just the general lines, oh, that three yeah. inch barrel, they're just probably the most intimidating looking Smith & Wesson yeah. revolver made. Really? What a great carry gun, other than the fact it weighs about it's, 12 pounds. Yeah, you need pounds. to wear suspenders when you're yeah. carrying that, but it's <laughs> just, to oh, me, yeah. one of the coolest looking Smith & Wessons. And I've had a number of them over the years and never kept them. When I finally got this one, I decided it was gonna stay around for a while. And uh, yeah, that's, just a cool That's gun. a great gun there. Yeah. I'm like you, I've always liked the three and a half, but I don't even think, I don't think I have one of these in my collection though. Oh, well that can be fixed with money. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Beautiful gun. Yeah, it is a, tr a very attractive gun. And I, I gotta tell people, if, of all the revolvers that I own, I think when you look at that gun, it's like, that is yeah. a serious gun. I remember uh, George Patton carried one of these. Mm -hmm. he carried a single action army in this, and he always referred to the, the 3 and a half, 27 is his killing gun, you know. So, anyway, neato gun. Then another one, we we were talking about that uh, five inch half lug Jimmy Ray 629. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they rebarreled it, they pulled the mountain gun barrel off of it. It was originally a mountain gun. And later I bought a square frame, square butt, because mm -hmm. all the mountain guns were round butts. I bought a square butt 629. And it's like a 629-3. But I sent the mountain gun barrel back up to Smith and had him install it, gold bead front sight, do the black powder bevels like mm -hmm. the, the uh, mountain guns had. I put a pair of Coco Ball Craig Spiegel square butt stocks on it because I love these things. And again, I think Jimmy tuned the action on this one. I said, Jimmy, I want it to bust magnums. So not as nice mm -hmm. as the five inch gun. But it's overall pretty nice gun. And again, a four inch square butt mountain gun is not, was never produced. Yeah. Except for, you know, unless you had one made up. Yeah, that's nice. Very nice. Got some cool toys, Ken. Yeah, I gotta show you a couple more here that aren't really you know, terribly exotic. In many ways, I've always been a fan of these. The most combat-tested revolver in history is the Smith & Wesson Model 10. Mm -hmm. 
And this gun went in production in 1899. They're still making Model 10s today. Yeah. They were only out of production for two years in World War I when the government took over the Smith & Wesson factory and made nothing but 1917 45 pistols. Mm -hmm. That's the only time they were in production. They've made more of these than any all their other guns practically put together. This is the bread and butter of Smith & Wesson line. And the four inch skinny barrel Model 10 is actually a classic now. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a soft spot in my heart for them. This was, prior to that Model 13 three inch, this was pretty much a standard issue gun in the FBI. And they're not, ex you know, they're not exotic, but let me tell you something, you get the job done. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if you're a revolver guy, you probably, and don't own a Model 10, you can, again, can be fixed with gun money, yeah. with money. Well, I actually have a couple of Model 10, so. I think, I think one of mine's a thin barrel, and one of them, one of them's a heavy, yeah. heavy barrel. Yeah, I've got a number of different ones. Actually, I've, I've always kind of liked the five inch, ones are always yeah. kind of mm -hmm. my favorites, but yeah, it's just, nice. and it's amazing. They always shoot good, you know. They're incredibly easy to shoot well. Yeah, if you take that with some good hollow point plus P loads, not, I mean, you yeah, get it's always, done. people don't understand. We're ate up in this gun culture where everybody forgets it's the end and it's not the arrow. Mm -hmm. And this will do just fine if you know what you're doing. Guys, well, it's on enough bullet, you know. Well, if you don't plan on missing, it's not good. Now we're going to kind of leave the revolver before we switch into another episode. But in 1963, a movie came out called Doctor No. It was the first of the James Bond movie, starred John Connery. John Connery. And two things about that movie: I remember going to it with my girlfriend in high school. It was a big deal. That movie was like wow. Two things in that movie were memorable. One was the choice of James Bond's gun, the Walter PPK. And the other was Ursula Andrus in that white bikini when she came walking out of the surf. <laughs> Bottom line is, I thought, I gotta have a PPK. I, I gotta have one. It took me a couple years or so to get it. This is one of the ones, you know, it's a German made 765 32 auto, which is what James Bond actually used. And I bought one of these, still have it. I, mean, I was like, man, that's my James Bond gun. By the way, terribly overrated guns. But that's an original German made, wow. probably about a 19, I bought that probably about, I, was, I think I was in, in the army, so probably around 65, 66. But that was my, I gotta have a gun just like James Bond. Mm. And it, as you know, they're just, they're not very pleasant to shoot. They got the terrible double wow. action trigger pulls. And uh, actually, they're pretty. If you don't watch the grip, sometimes the slide will come back and cut grooves in your mm -hmm. hand. And yeah. you yeah. know, overrated beyond belief. Anybody with fatty, you know, skin no, in that area, no, they these, always, these things leave you alive. Yeah. And since it's a basically a blowback, God, they kick like everything. They're, oh, they're, they're nasty they're, little guns, yeah. yeah. But anyway, but again, at, at the time we talk about different things that affect us. You can remember when the Dirty Harry movie started, and everybody in the world wanted a Model Twenty Nine. Oh so. yeah. So it, when, when I saw the first James Bond movie, it was called Dr. No, the very first. And of course it started a, still going on to this day, the mm -hmm. James Bond sequence. But the, the PPK was something I thought, I gotta have a gun just like James Bond. And there it is. Yeah. Well, folks, as far as some of the guns that I like and some of the guns that I really still enjoy, but I don't shoot much anymore, we just saw. And again, Bill, you know, I come to your place and I always get to visit your nice pile of guns. So I thought I'd give you a chance yeah, to take a look at Yeah, it's awesome to get to see some of these cool guns and especially the ones that have such the history like the Charlie Gillis gun, yeah. you know, stuff yeah. like that. And listen, folks, once again, we'll remind you, don't be afraid to push that subscribe button. Um, lots of more material coming down the road. So a lot of it I think you'll find interesting. And by the way, don't be afraid to make uh, an entry in that comment section if you have questions or material or stuff that you're, you'd like to see in future episodes. So, until the next time, stay safe. Be good on the range. Adios.